Welcome to The Merly End. I'm Dominic Machado, and today I'm joined by everyone's favorite Sri Lankan sports journalist, Estelle Vasudevan. We'll be discussing the Sri Lanka-Ireland series, white ball series that has just wrapped up. But before that, we need you to follow, like, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on, be it um, Facebook or on YouTube or on your podcast app. In addition, we want to announce, too, that um, in the after the second test, the men are traveling in England after the second test at Lourdes, every day you will get a chance to meet up with Nick and Mark at the Three Falcons pub just outside um, outside the venue. And you don't have to go to the match in order to go. You can just meet them there for a beer. I'm told there will be special guests. I'm not sure who those special guests will be, but I'd imagine it'll be a lot of fun. I know uh, Nick and Mark are really excited to meet all of you and get a chance to chat with them. Uh, feel free to DM either of them if you have any questions about where to meet or what they're doing. So every day after the end of play. Also, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter, which is coming out thick and fast these days. Mark and Nick are on the ground, so they're providing reports, they're providing information. It's really, really useful if you're a huge fan of Sri Lanka cricket. All right, but enough about the test series. We're going to talk about Sri Lanka's um, trip to Ireland. They're kind of the the Sri Lankan women's final sort of tune-up before the Women's World Cup. In now in UAE, which we'll talk about in a minute, in October. Um, so I think after winning the Asia Cup, expectations kind of soared, right? They thought, okay, Ireland, this is going to be an easy uh, win for Sri Lanka. But it turned out to be harder than expected. Uh, the T20 series was drawn 1-1, and Ireland won the ODI series 2-1. Um, so Estelle, my question from, for you is, what did we learn in this series? Is there anything that we should be concerned about? Anything that we should be thinking about um, in light of what happened? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't the result anyone was expecting, was it? I mean, just as Sri Lanka's Asia Cup win came as a surprise, I think a lot of people have been taken by surprise by the results in this series. The T20 series, you got the feeling that, you know, it was you could have just written it off as a one-off, right? Like that loss in the second game. Mm -hmm. But the ODI is for Ireland to come in and win the first two games. And the way they did it, right, um, was excellent. I thought, I mean, they really showed that they, they are no pushovers, right? So Sri Lanka, yeah. I felt, were caught a bit by surprise at how good Ireland was. But it also really, I think, you know, shone the spotlight on the areas that Sri Lanka really need to work on going into two major tournaments in the in this year and the next. Uh, one, the middle order batting. You've had mm. a lot of runs coming from the top four in that batting lineup. You've had Atapattu, of course, who's been carrying the batting lineup for the last number of years. And now you've got players like Harshita Samaravikrama, Vishmi Gunaratna, uh, Kavisha Dilhari also getting runs. But then from that point onwards, it's a bit tricky because you have Nilakshi De Silva, who was in pretty good form, I would say, uh, maybe about a year ago. She was making runs. She was able to, you know, clear mm. the boundary, getting quick runs at the death. Um, and it looked like Sri Lanka had found that kind of finisher with her um, partnering up with um, Kavisha. Uh, but that form seems to have fallen away now. Like I mentioned, like they're getting a lot of runs from the top four. So the opportunities Nilakshi is getting at number six and number seven are very, very little, right? And mm. so far, this in this in the Asia Cup and during this series, she hasn't been able to do much. Anushka Anushka Sanjeevani had a couple of really good um, innings where we thought, you know, this is her turning a new leaf just when like people mm. were talking about should she be in the 11 she produced a couple of really good knocks but since then again she's fallen away a bit right and you're not getting too many runs out of her i think the biggest concern is probably hasini pereira right i know she got a mm. 40 odd in the second odi if i'm not mistaken yeah. but i can't think of even one memorable innings from her Maybe one against India, I think she she got a 20 or 30. But I can't think of too many innings where she's made an impact. And I think that's going to be a worry for Sri Lanka because you 
can't be we've seen like over the years right being dependent on one player can only get you so far and now they've moved maybe they've moved on from being overly dependent on atapattu but they still have some kinks in that batting lineup and i think hasini pereira is probably the one that concern them concerns them the most because she's the only other left hander in that uh, mm-hmm. sorry she's that left hander in the middle order who they need to be making runs right so that'll be a concern the other part is of course as we discussed previously on this part right the wicket takers where are your wicket taking where are your wicket wicket taking options in mm. the t20 lineup you had the likes of inoshi fernando you had kavisha dilhari uh, picking up wickets they've been the major uh, you know uh, partnership breakers they've yeah. kept things tight in the death and the middle overs as well in in the odi game certainly from the, if you're going if you're going from this series that is definitely a concern because you know she doesn't really play um odi cricket right she's mm-hmm. she's more or less been considered as a t20 specialist since her comeback in 2023 um i know she played the last game in this series but i think if they were naming a 15 member squad she was probably not going to be in it for the odi squad um so that is a major concern because if you look at the bowling lineup um their first choice probably is udeshika prabodhini achini kulasurya the the two medium pacers then you've got sugandhika kumari you've got uh, uh who am i missing you've got atapattu you've got kavisha mm-hmm. right you've got maybe sachini nisansala in that lineup right yep. where are your wickets coming from i don't think they're going too many are going to come through deshika and achini uh, apart from an mm. one off right like the third game um because there are more containment options and i think we were discussing off air about you know the difference between t20 and odi cricket in that sense is that in like you said t20 cricket you can get away with having a lot of containment options and maybe one yeah. wicket taking option because it's only 20 overs right but in a 50 over game and we saw that in the second uh, mm. odi where all up endergrass pay, played sorry the first odi where pendergrass played that fantastic innings i think with five to six overs to go sri lanka would have thought it's in the bag right because they had the they had the bowlers to contain yeah but unfortunately when you don't pick up wickets teams are always in it right until the last over and that's what happened in that first game right so that will be another i know like i mean i've said this before as well you probably look at past performances and think that's not a huge issue because they've somehow managed to make things work but it's certainly an area that they need to look into uh, maybe you know she fernando is going to be a long term option in that lineup um, i i think They, they are reluctant to play her because they have two off spinners in Atapattu and Kavisha yeah. anyway. Um, but maybe that's one option they need to look at, and we have to go back to uh, what's keeping Inoka Ranavira out of this team, right? Yeah, I think I think that that question of Inoka Ranavira, I was just going to ask you that till you mentioned her. I think um, it seems like Sri Lanka have really good options when it comes to T twenty bowling that. um they might play who they might have play ahead of Inoka but i think when it comes to the ODI setup she is a wicket taker and she's someone who can bowl in those middle overs and create some turbulence there right because even you know i think i think it's something to say that taking wickets in the T20 game is a little bit different than taking wickets in the 50 over game right someone like Wanindu Hasaranga who you have to attack right or Kavisha Dilhari on the other hand right who you have to attack in the T20 game you're going to get wickets that way right because you're coming at them constantly but if you can play them out right and say okay we're going to just tick you out for 4 5 and over then it becomes very very difficult to take wickets mm-hmm. right and i think that's why they've been kind of taking um bringing along such any nisansala particularly mm-hmm. in the odi format they're hoping that she can turn into that wicket taking option um i think one of the things that they might do is give uh Sashini Gimhani some game time because if she proves herself able to take wickets and i think um having a wrist spinner in those middle overs in the 50 yeah. over game 
kind of keeps you in the game, right? One great delivery can can do the trick. The other question is, and, and this kind of relates to your both middle order question and the bowling question. Do you think that maybe they can play an extra bowler, someone like Amakantana, um, who can hit a little bit down the order and can provide just an option, right? You know, I think if you don't have that many strike bowlers, having different options that you can kind of set up matchups for or set up different ploys for could also be effective. So do you think that there's a chance that Kanchana maybe gets some game time? I know unlikely given the given how close we are to the World Cup, but do you think that's something they might consider? I think it 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 must be, right? Because we did see her get a couple of opportunities during this series. We saw we saw her hit a massive six in yep. one of the T20s and suddenly you were like, okay, look Maybe we can chase this. Uh, Sri Lanka's big problem, and I was just about to mention the the possibly the reason why they've been trying to use Sachin in Isansala is because now their um their scheduled games are done right for this cycle, yeah. so they don't really have any scheduled tours until the next until the next year when they'll be playing the World Cup. I'm sure uh, SLC will be able to put together a couple of series, maybe mm-hmm. uh, traveling to India, you know. But at the moment, they don't have scheduled series. So they needed to get every, every person who they wanted to try out, they needed to do it now within the Women's yeah. Championship just to ensure that they have those options. So that may be a reason why Sachin Isansala was, um, you know, uh, pushed into the ODI side as well because you've got a year to build on whatever you have right and and she's already shown that she can be a, a good asset for that bowling lineup uh, very tight with her lines and stuff so she can be a good good option it's just about like you said like working on different options uh, so that you you're not going into a world cup or you're not going into the year uh, world cup year just with this these are our five options these are the five bowlers we are playing right you need to kind of have a uh, few other um, yeah. players maybe on the bench and that's i think that's yeah. the issue they're yeah. facing with the batting and, and as guess... well because they've stuck with the same kind of seven batters and now it's a bit too late to change things around in the T20 lineup. Yeah, I, I think that was my next question is, are there options for people who they can bring in in that middle order? I think I, I think that's one of the sort of good and bad things that have happened as it pertains to um, Sri Lanka's batting lineup is because there haven't been a ton of options outside of the seven batters that they've played, people like Harshita and Vishmi have kind of gotten an un, mm. sort of a unbroken run and they've they've improved a lot because of that. But now since sort of our, our quality of our team has improved, right, since now we are trying to do more than just hang around and qualify for tournaments but want to make noise, are there options that we can bring in for a Hassani Pereira or a Nilakshi um, De Silva, also considering that um, some of them are quite old, right? Mm-hmm. You know, in, in, in a cricketing sense, Anushka Sanjeevani, you know, and, and Nilakshi are both on the older side of things. So grooming replacements is going to be important. Who do you see as kind of potentially filling those roles in the next in the next few years to come? From what I can see, there are a few players in that under-19 setup who they're looking at. Deomi Vihanga, I think, is one player who mm-hmm. people have had an eye on since since that twenty uh, under-19 World Cup, right? There, yeah. there is possibly some reason where, why they haven't kind of blooded her yet because, I mean, they obviously don't have a problem with bringing in... Uh, under 19s into the squad, right? Because we had, uh, obviously, we've had Shashini Gimhani. We had another under 19 player in the squad for, um, I think, the mm-hmm. the West Indies series. So they, they don't have a problem with that. So there's pro- possibly some reason why Devami Vihanga hasn't come in yet. She's yeah. definitely one. But I think if you look at the older players, uh, maybe someone like uh, uh, Kaushini Nutyangana, who is a wicket keeper. But he's also a pretty decent bat. We haven't seen her make runs on the international level yet. Uh, she's got an opportunity here and there, but 
you know hasn't made any big runs but she could be an option the other one is malsha shehani mm. who who's not very young uh, she's in her late 20s but i see her kind of as a player who you you should be looking at to um be that finisher type player who can clear the boundary uh, she's an off spinner as well so she gives you that you know bowling option uh, those are two i can think of who are kind of on the periphery right now who are mm. you know almost in but like i said because they've kind of stuck with these seven batters for so long i don't think we will see any changes at least for the t20 world cup maybe mm. they switch around amar yeah. kanchana and hasini but i i don't see them bringing in someone completely new um into the 15 mhm mhm yeah i think that that makes a lot of sense i think um yeah do uh, do me with hunga the the other thing is again another bowling option that's that's the big mm. benefit but of course, right, we need to take time and it takes time for players to adjust. We've seen how long it's taken for Vishmi and Harshatha to improve. So I think the other thing we have to know is that anyone that's brought into the squad, you can't just expect them to come in yeah. and play a brilliant knock and, and, and do that job. So I guess, you know, we'll get to the good stuff from the tour in a minute. But one question I have is, so if um, you had to rate your level of concern that this tour gave you in terms of the upcoming World Cup, with one being, I'm not concerned at all, and five being, I'm really, really concerned, right? Because I think everyone was kind of riding high after that Asia Cup win. Where would you, uh, where would you put your, your concern level after this loss to Ireland? I think we can still be kind of pretty optimistic about the World Cup. I don't think it's, it, obviously it's an unexpected loss, but um, I don't think there's cause for too much concern. The, the issues Sri Lanka have are the same issues they had in the Asia Cup, which they managed to overcome in that tournament. But um, there isn't anything new that has cropped up. So I don't think it's too concerning. I would put myself at like, uh, wait, you said, Zero is not concerned at all, right? Yeah. Okay, so I would probably be like at a one or a two. Yeah, I would um, put myself because, at about like a I said, two because I think um, rightly or wrongly, uh, you know, these are concerns that we've either ignored. Yeah. Right. And that have been around and, you know, they kind of, I'm not saying that they they rain on the parade as much as they remind us, yes, there are ways that this team can be exploited and defeated if the other team knows what they're doing. Right. So I think I think that's the big thing for me is that it is there's, as you said, nothing new about it. Right. And that it's something that we just have to be aware of and plan around as best we can going into the future matches. Now, the good things, two good things that come to mind, the first of which is the form of Harshita Samarikrama and Vishmi Gunaratna. We've talked a lot about this on this podcast. What other what other great things can we say, Estelle? Because, you know, it's all positive <laughs> as far as they are concerned. Yeah, really positive signs for Sri Lanka. Particularly, I think Vishmi's 100 is a massive positive because you saw how she's a different player from someone like Harshita, right? Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. is a player who can clear the boundary. And I mean, it's funny to say it now, but, um, you know, getting 400 something in a 30 over match, obviously she's someone who can clear the boundary, right? It, it, it doesn't need to be said, but she's shown that in the recent past that she can clear the boundary easily and she can be that aggressive option for Sri Lanka at the mm. top of the order. Um, so that was really encouraging to see. Of course, the youngest Sri Lankan man, man or woman to score a century in ODI cricket, which, I mean, that's a massive achievement, right? I know it's taken a yeah. couple of years and we've discussed how maybe it was too early to bring her in, but that that faith is, you know, paying dividends now. With Harshita, what I love about her, and I, I mentioned this in a different pod I do with uh, good areas as well, is that I love that she knows her limitations, right? And she yeah. knows what her strengths are and what her weaknesses are. And she really plays to them really well. Like, she, like I mentioned, she's not a big hitter, right? 
Mm. Yeah, she can get a couple of sixes, but she is not a player who you're expecting to get five, six, seven sixes in an innings, right? But she's managed to find a way where she has her shots that she can target particular areas mm. off the ground to clear the boundary. And when she can't do that, she's able to find the boundary with good timing and proper placement right which is yeah. really good to see it's something you know that she that has grown so much over the last couple of years um so it's really good to see one thing i would say is obviously the fielding hasn't been great from her yeah uh, I mean, part of it is probably a confidence thing, right? You you put one catch down, it it's in your head, you drop another one, and then mm. it's, you know, you can't get over it. And I'm also hearing, actually, Mark was the one who told me that she has an injury on her webbing. Ah, so okay. that could be impacting the way she feels. And I, I, and I know she had a fracture in one of her fingers or wrist a couple of months ago as well. So all of this probably contribute to the fact that she's been putting down a lot of, you know, straightforward catches. And this is one of Sri Lanka's better fielders, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah. that is one area that she, she would definitely want to work on. Yeah, I think I think that that difference you pointed to, right? I think Avishmi is playing straight down the ground. She's not afraid to go over the top. Um, very sort of classical in the way that she scores runs. And Harshita, right? It's about the timing and the placement. She loves going square, threading those gaps. Uh, and you know, the six hitting, right? As you said, she doesn't have the power that Vishmi has, but she knows where she can score those sixes. Like a couple of um, the sixes have been pulls. Um, you know, very, very fine, where she knows, okay, I can just basically throw my entire body into it and get it over fine leg, right? And, and get runs that way. And she's got the inventor shot. She's got the reverse sweep. She's got the lap. Um, so she's a very creative And run she runs scorer. really uh, hard as well, right? Like when yeah. she's at the crease, you have so many runs just, you know, snuck in when she, particularly yeah. when she's batting with, Kavisha, which we Kavisha, obviously saw at the say. Asia Cup final as well. Like, yeah, you want big hitters, right? Of course, yeah. that's the that's the way the game is going. But for a player like Harshita, who it's probably difficult to develop that skill um, to the extent of, say, say an Atapattu, you have yeah. to make do with what you have, right? And I think she's done that brilliantly over the last couple of years. Yeah, and I think the thing that's interesting is j just a couple of numbers because I'm I'm working on a a piece, albeit very slowly, <laughs> uh, on on Harshita. But she is the fourth highest scorer in uh, women's T20 uh, T20Is over the last two years. Her average is forty seven point um, seven, which is higher than almost anyone except for Haley Matthews. Mm -hmm. She's striking at one oh six. We'll get to the strike rate at a moment. Uh, and she's hit 650s, which is fantastic. The only people above her are Atapatu, Haley Matthews, and uh, Oza from the UAE, mm -hmm. who played that fantastic knock yeah. against us as well, right? Um, and then in the last year, right, that this is 2024, I think she is the second highest scorer behind only Chamari. And mm -hmm. she's striking now at 120. So she was striking in the high 90s last year, and now this year she's striking at 120, which is absolutely brilliant right because as you said she's not a natural power player but she's figured out her game to the extent where she knows how to find gaps she knows how to um score in gaps and the other thing that's super exciting about harshita is that she is a woman for a crisis time she's the master mm -hmm. of a chase and if you look at how at her stats in t20s batting um first versus second this past year she's been striking in excess of 130 while chasing, which is yeah. just absolutely brilliant. And um, it takes pressure off of Vishmi. It takes pressure off of uh, Atapattu to know that you have someone who can score quickly, even if they're not clearing the boundary. Now you have someone who can run hard. And then you pair that with Kavisha at four. You've got a really, really solid top four who can do sorts of different things, who can hit for power, who can, who has great uh, players who have great placement. So it's amazing to see Harshita. And then, you know, to follow up Vishmi's 100, right? The first ever 100 scored uh, in white ball cricket by a Sri Lankan woman whose name is not Chamri Atapattu, 
Harsitha goes and does at the next match, right? Because I think Estelle, you had said that for your money, Harsitha was going to be the one who would who would break into that, and she was the second. So that's also great to see, uh, and I think it it tells you that um, these women are putting their hand up to take the mantle from Chamri. Obviously, you can't go about replacing a player of Chamri's mm-hmm. quality, but very very special stuff. Um, the second really good thing that I wanted to point out and that we talked about a little bit off air is the attention paid to these matches. Mm -hmm. Um, Estelle as someone who, um, you know, and I think you spoke very movingly about this when you were talking with Madushka after the Asia cup victory, can you talk about the crowds, the coverage that turned out for these matches against Ireland and what they tell you about the development of the women's game, not only in Sri Lanka, but around the world? Yeah, it was really great, I thought, to see the number of Sri Lankans who had turned up at the grounds, actually, right? Ireland is, like, not not a place where you expect big um, Sri Lankan crowds to come in. And I'm I'm not talking about thousands and thousands here, but they were clearly... There were clearly more Sri Lankans than Irish people in Mm -hmm. in those grounds, right? And that was really encouraging to see because it it sends the message that people want to watch these girls play, right? And that's the same thing we saw in the Asia Cup as well. I mean, there are always going to be people who say, you know, it was free entry or whatever. But no matter how much you try to diminish that or the crowds that turned up there in Dambulla, this series, the games were teleca- the games were telecast on the two mm-hmm. major, you know, paid platforms on TV, Dialogue TV and PO TV, with a dedicated channel for the games, right? Um, it was on Facebook Live as well. So it was accessible via streaming. It was on the Dialogue View app as well. Mm-hmm. So mobile streaming as well. None of this is, I'm telling you, none of this is happening without that Asia Cup win. So yeah. the... It, it, it is massively impactful because, I mean, I can tell you, I, I've spoken about this before on the pod as well, right? Like when New Zealand came to Sri Lanka last year, um, Sri Lanka cricket were not interested in streaming the the games because there was no income. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't expecting any investment to come through it, right? Or a profit to come through it. But now things are slowly changing, and I think it's a testament to how well the 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 players have played, um, mm. and also you know credit to Sri Lanka cricket who have invested in the women's game. Whether it's you know obviously there is uh, there's a ton of room to grow, right? Yeah, but of course, what they have done is it has impacted the team's growth, right? Maybe it hasn't been as quickly as it should be, or, you know, as as um, good as you would want it to be for a quick growth, but there have mm-hmm. been developments from the board's end as well. And the, 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 the audience is, is seeing the fruits of that, right? And at yeah. the end of the day, I think a lot of the credit should go to the players as well who have applied themselves and who haven't been, you know, discouraged by the fact that they, when they play a game on the mm-hmm. stream, you have all these weird comments or, you know, what people say about them, but um, continue to be dedicated to what they're doing and you're seeing the results of that now. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point too. And And even as someone, you know, who doesn't live in Sri Lanka, I was able to get the game through uh, Ireland Cricket's uh, YouTube channel, which was brilliant. Yeah, and I think and... We, we need to shout them out as well, because yeah. if, if you remember a couple of series ago when South Africa was hosting, it could not be found anywhere, right? Like oh, no one yeah. no one knew where it was. Even if you knew where it was, you couldn't find a, like a steady that, right? stream, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember trying to find every kind of streaming service mm-hmm. to to try to play that match as they were chasing down this big total <laughs> and it was nearly impossible um yeah you have to give ireland cr- a cricket credit and also you know for the pitches that they laid and we were talking about yeah. this off air really sporting pitches that um allowed for good cricket to be played it's going to be a massive 
um, plus for Ireland cricket in the future. And they're definitely going to go from strength to strength. And you can see they have some really, really talented yeah. players. Warla Prendergast looks like a player who who could be in any team in the world. That 100 from Amy Lewis was also a brilliant mm. one too. Um, so shout out to, to Ireland for cricket for putting out a really great product that people were able to watch. And and I think um, you can imagine that someone like Harshita, right, who's just signed, right, um, to, to Trinidad for the CPL, right? I think who's she replacing Beth Mooney, is that right? I forget uh, I'm who, not too sure, was. yeah. Yeah, but she, she's signed. I'd imagine the fact that people are able to watch these matches plays a huge role, right? People saw her knock against India. Then people saw her follow-up knocks against uh, the Irish team and thought, okay, this is a player we, we want to have in our squad. So it's a huge opportunity for our players as well, not only um, to enhance their bottom lines, right? They're getting franchise contracts, but to improve their play, to go around the world, to learn that way. And, and I think... Uh, Mark and I were talking about this the other day, um, and I said, you know, I think it's a year or two before Vishmi and, and Harshita get mm. some type of franchise contract. But I was wrong, right? It, it, it's happening already, and it's so good to see that. It's so good to see the girls getting the recognition that they so richly deserve. Um, so massive shout out to, to Ireland, massive shout out to the Sri Lankan crowds who showed up. And even on social media, there are a lot of people, a lot more people who are tuned in to the yeah. games who are watching them more closely, a lot more conversation going on. So uh, that's something, you know, as Estelle said, long ways to go, but really encouraging signs. And I'm super excited for what the next few years will bring. Um, speaking of what the next few years will bring, let's look at what the next few months will bring, right? So we said no scheduled tours between now and the World Cup. But the big news, right, unfortunately, uh, the World Cup has been moved out of Bangladesh in October due to um, some problematic political circumstances that are going on. And it's just been announced that it will be played in the UAE. Um, Estelle, we're no stranger to having tournaments moved mm -hmm. from, yeah. you know, uh, from South Asia to UAE. What do we think are the... What are you worried about with this move from Bangladesh to UAE? And what are you excited about with that move? I'm very interested to see if it it changes the way Sri Lanka play. Um, because the, U, the Bangladesh, a lot of people were expecting it to be slow and low pitches, right? And that's what we've seen from Bangladesh over the last few years. Domestically, they've had a couple of high scoring um, games, but from what I hear, that's neither Dhaka or Silet where the World Cup was mm. supposed to be played. So now with conditions expected to be much different and more batting friendly, particularly with, I mean, Sharjah is even in the men's game, short boundaries, high, yeah. high scoring games, the toss um, is a big factor in the UAE. And we saw that in the last Asia Cup that Sri Lanka played there, right? Like yeah. chasing was the way to go. So all of that, I wonder how that changes plans for Sri Lanka. I, I wonder if it changes plans, because like I said, they've been pretty consistent with the 15s they have picked yeah. um, right throughout the last 18 months or two years, right? So um, I'll be very interested to see if there are any changes, whether they want to kind of bring somebody else into the side. Um, one thing I'm excited about is the fact that, okay, so if, if you had asked me, uh, end of 2022 or early 2023, this would have been a disaster for Sri Lanka because they would have been 100% dependent on the uh, slow bowlers kind of strangling opposition and yeah. getting them bowled out for lower scores and then, you know, chasing those. But what we saw in the Asia Cup was in good batting conditions. Sri Lanka can still compete really well yeah. because they've got a couple of players who who are in good form. And I think that's one thing I'm excited to see if it is batting friendly conditions. Um, Sri Lanka aren't going to be a pushover um, in the UAE. Yeah. And of course, just like Sri Lanka, plans for the other teams also will change, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you take a team like Australia, who is, you know, uh, probably not used to playing in um, spin 
pain friendly conditions like bangladesh what they would have prepared for and now having to pivot from that like a month away from the tournament uh, they are going to have to make changes as well right and we we yeah. we it'll be interesting to see how some of those teams go about it i mean teams like india have a very like a well rounded bowling attacks and you know they're used to conditions yeah. like that but it'll be interesting to see what some of the teams do because it's it's basically the same situation everyone finds themselves in now right hmm. yeah and i wonder too right since um you know obviously the organization of sri lanka cricket is a little bit nebulous but at the high performance center they have a lot of coaches and mentors who have coached and mentored players who have played in the uae right the the yeah. sri lankan men's side has played in the uae tons and tons of times right so i imagine there's a lot of knowledge right about what conditions are like how to play and i'm hoping right um that that will get passed on to ramesh and that he'll be able to kind yeah, of yeah sri lanka played the uh, qualifiers there as well right so right right they, right of course they do they have, have a little advantage. bit of forgot, yeah. yeah yeah so i think that they should have even though it's a change i think as you said right the batting is more well suited to that um and i think it'll be it'll be interesting because i think they have the ability to do well and to use strategy to get on top of the strategy knowing that okay well chasing is going to matter right how do we play with do right all these kind mm -hmm. of questions that come up um in, in a tournament like that i think estelle unless you have anything else that you want to add i think that might be a good point to stop um if you got this far and haven't subscribed yet, I have to say, what are you doing? Please hit a like, follow, subscribe, comment. We love when you comment, right? Whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on your podcast app, or whether it's on YouTube, subscribe to the newsletter and stay tuned for plenty more stuff from us. All right. Thank you. Bye.